Thank you, Libby, to inviting me to give a talk and the organizers. Uh, I am an assistant professor over at the University of Central Florida in Orlando, and I was hired in 2013 to take over a very long-term sea turtle uh, program there that had been run and founded by Dr. Lou Earhart. And sea turtles in general, they could you could argue that they are excellent science ambassadors. You could also argue that Florida is pretty much the place for sea turtles in the continental U.S. And in terms of the uh, sea turtle activity in Florida, not only do they occupy coastal habitats as uh, larger juveniles and adults that forage, but we have incredible nesting beaches all along the coastline, both on the east coast and on the west coast. The continent, or within Western Hemisphere, most of the sea turtle nesting occurs in Florida, and I would say of all of the loggerhead nesting, which is one species of turtles, occurs along the Florida coastline. Uh, the beach that I took over and the program that I took over uh, from Dr. Lou Earhart includes about 50 kilometers of beach in central Florida, and I'll show an image of that in a minute. And that uh, nesting beach is the most important nesting beach in the Western Hemisphere. We get tens of thousands of sea turtle nests in any given season, but it's also only 20 kilometers long for the highest concentration of sea turtle nesting. So you can imagine with uh, hurricanes and other issues, uh, while we get an enormous number of nests that represent about, uh, for loggerheads, 15 to 20 percent of all Florida loggerheads nest in this 20 kilometer stretch of beach, and 30 percent of all green turtle nests and other species occur in that stretch of beach um, from in Florida. Uh, if something happens to that beach, what's going to happen to the population? But it's also an incredible uh, pulse point to keep tabs of the Atlantic populations. Now, sea turtles are very long-lived species. They're very late maturing. And as a result, it is a little bit more difficult to manage them because you have uh, animals that use the nesting beach. So they use both terrestrial and marine habitat as part of their life history and part of their life cycle. They, uh, adult females are the only ones that come ashore, and they come ashore to nest in Florida's beaches anywhere from March through about October, depending upon the species. And the nests are laid. We have hatchlings that emerge. They then transition to offshore habitats. They'll have a quick um, frenzy period where they use up the last of their yolk stores and get far offshore, and then they encounter uh, ocean currents but then they disappear from our radar for a number of years. We don't know a lot about this offshore uh, time frame, this offshore uh, stage. And then eventually they recruit back into nearshore habitats to places like the Indian River Lagoon, Florida Bay, uh, the Chesapeake Bay, even further up north. And they will then uh, remain there for a number of years as these larger benthic uh, bottom feeding organisms or turtles that will feed off of blue crabs and other um, bottom organisms. And then eventually they may recruit to a new uh, adult habitat as larger um, adults and forage there and make reproductive migrations every few years to their areas where they ideally or the, where they originally hatched out um, to their natal beaches. So the beach that we, uh, my lab uh, monitors is uh, the Archicar National Wildlife Refuge. And we also monitor about, like I mentioned, 50 kilometers of beach um, in central Florida. But from Sebastian Inlet, just north of Vero Beach, all the way up to uh, Patrick Air Force Base, just south of the Kennedy Space Center, this uh, stretch of beach is incredible. And uh, the little clip that I showed gives you an idea of just in one short time frame, how many turtles come up on that beach. And in one night, we may end up seeing more turtles nesting than most other nesting beaches see in an entire season in Florida. Uh, we will get about 400, uh, 500 nests in just one night. We may get up to 1,200 turtle crawls or encounters on the beach. So we do have three different species of turtles. We have uh, leatherbacks, which are not as common, and the beach that I monitor, it's pretty much the northern extent of the leatherback nesting. We do have loggerheads, and historically that 
species has been the dominant species on this beach. And then in more recent years, and you may have seen in uh, the last couple of years, the green turtles are just going, like, going gangbusters in their nesting throughout the state. And uh, back in the 1980s, when this project uh, that I took over first started monitoring that nesting beach, they had maybe 40 green turtle nests. This summer, we had over 16,000. And so what we're seeing is an exponential growth in terms of the um, green turtle nesting, at least for the short term. And uh, each uh, year that we have these peak years for green turtles, they exceed the prior peak year. It's pretty incredible. So we haven't had that plateau. We haven't had a, you know, we, have it, we don't even know what the carrying capacity is yet on the beach. So Florida, in general, has a really great index nesting beach program. They have a couple other um, programs where there's a standardized protocol to count nests and to also look at the reproductive output of any um, given nest. So once a nest hatches out, you can inventory it, count up how many eggs had hatched out, and get an estimate of what, uh, how many hatchlings were produced from a particular beach. Um, on our beach, because we have tens of thousands, we subsample, but on a lot of other Florida beaches, people um, will look at every single nest, and you might see little staked off nests on various beaches. But the big question here is, uh, it, it, we're looking at just a snapshot, and it is a really good way to keep tabs on trends in the population, but if you remember, these species reach maturity for a couple decades. So something might happen to them, in a 20-year 20 um, period where the juveniles may have some sort of impact, but we may not see that realized on a nesting beach for decades. And one of the biggest uh, data gaps historically has been what happens to these little guys as soon as they leave the nesting beach during that offshore oceanic phase. And there's a lot that we know about them based on uh, inferences and maybe some lab work and uh, opportunistic sightings in different areas. Uh, it's been assumed that they're passive little drifters. Once they use up that yolk store, they get offshore and then they passively drift in all the different ocean currents for however many years. Uh, we also know or assume that they are surface dwellers. They don't have a huge lung capacity. They're slightly positively buoyant. They can't really dive and sustain a dive for a long period of time at that early life stage. Uh, we also assume and uh, somewhat know that they are oceanic animals and that they uh, associate with sargassum, a brown floating macroalgae, and that they might, uh, it's been hypothesized at least, that they remain within gyre currents. And they have, uh, based on laboratory studies by Ken Lohman, some really cool seminal work that he did uh, taking naive animals that had never been in the wild, exposing them to uh, different magnetic fields and looking at their orientation and their behavior in a laboratory in a tank setting, he showed that they would significantly orient to remain within this big circular gyre system in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, they likely would not leave that, at least for North Atlantic loggerheads, because you know, if you leave it, you get into colder waters where they may not survive, or uh, they may be lost to the population if they head down to the South Atlantic. But the reality is, is that no one's really been able to track and follow these guys for long periods of time to really understand how they interact with their oceanic environment, how they are uh, um, moving relative to oceanographic features. And part of this problem is because uh, tag technology hasn't been small enough. We can, are not able yet to satellite tag uh, little hatchling turtles. It would require a tag that's about 0.2 grams in weight. Uh, but a couple years or several years ago, some smaller solar-powered bird tags were developed by microwave telemetry, and now there are several other options where we're able to uh, at least use turtles that are a little bit larger, about 10 centimeters, so they're uh, three to six months old, not necessarily you know, hatchlings, but we can look at these larger um, oceanic, or not larger, but you know, small stage, but uh, larger than hatchling uh, turtles, about the size of maybe a cereal bowl, something like that. And we can follow their movements for several months now. Uh, part of the trick was to figure out how to tag these guys and how to keep the tags on the turtles. 
we did a series of lab tests where we ended up uh, pretty much ruling out almost everything because the turtles were growing so quickly that they would shed the tags very, very quickly. Uh, the top layer of their scoots uh, would peel, similar to how your fingernails peel. Um, if, you have, if you ever paint your fingernails and that eventually peels, uh, or you know, put glue a little bling on it or something like that, everything would eventually fall off as the fingernail grows. And we came to kind of this aha moment in the lab when I was admiring Dr. Jeanette Wanneken, she's at FAU, her, um, her toenails because she had just had waves painted on and some turtles at that time. Uh, she had a great uh, pedicure. And we kind of look at each other. She calls her manicurist and asks her manicurist, what would you do if uh, you had peeling nails? How would you treat that? And she recommended an acrylic nail fill um, kit which we then tried on the backs of the turtles, painted it onto the shells, and the tags were able to stay on for several months um, and allow for a little bit of growth. Uh, we also used some uh, hair extension glue, toupee glue, and uh, uh, glued a little bit of neoprene on either side of this ridge that goes down the center line of the turtles, and then used a flexible uh, aquarium silicone to allow for the turtles to grow a little bit. Uh, and this works really well on loggerheads, hawksbills, and Kemp's Ridleys. Uh, we had to go back to the drawing board for green turtles, but we did find that 3M5200, if you have a boat, uh, that works really well on the backs of green turtles. Green turtles have a very different shell type, and it typically, um, nothing can stick to them. So if anyone can figure out what that is on the back of, like what the chemical makeup of it is, it would be great to paint on the bottom of uh, boats. Nothing would stick to it. So this enabled us to finally satellite tag some smaller turtles. And initially we used lab-reared turtles, but it really opened our eyes because these guys are doing things that were unexpected. And we tagged both loggerheads and greens. Uh, the first loggerhead tracks, uh, turtles did remain in that gyre system, but many of them dropped into the Sargasso Sea. That was unexpected. Many of them went to Bermuda. Many of them uh, also uh, hung out on the edges of mesoscale eddies as well, which we see in larger juveniles and some adult uh, behavior. And what it really uh, told us too is that, yeah, those turtles were staying off the continental shelf, uh, but they were doing things a little bit differently than what we expected. Uh, we did, um, this is just a quick track of one of the turtles that you can see left the Gulf Stream, uh, what you see are white uh, vector cur for currents and temperature is represented um, by the you know, colored background. Warmer being uh, warmer temperatures, cooler colors being cooler temperatures. And this is a turtle that went just to Bermuda, pretty much beeline. Uh, we also noticed that the tags had a higher temperature that it was uh, transmitting to us than models and other oceanographic uh, models uh, predicted sea surface temperature in the area as well as satellite imagery. And so sargassum is, uh, is often associated with sea turtles and at this young stage. And they uh, get a bit of a benefit from this. They uh, are protected from predators. That's a little turtle there, but a visual predator can't easily distinguish that from uh, sargassum. And they also are, it's filled with food and lots of little things that the uh, turtles can eat. But it's likely also providing a bit of a thermal benefit to a cold-blooded little animal that needs to grow quickly to outgrow the jaws of uh, predators and sharks, among other things. And so sargassum uh, is emerging as not only you know, something that provides nice habitat, but also perhaps a thermal benefit. And thinking about this management-wise, the data from some of our earlier work were used to help establish critical habitat for these little guys. Granted, you know, this is best available data, 17 tracks equals one of the largest critical habitat designations um, under the ESA, which is a little nerve wracking. But uh, if you think about sargassum biomass, the net movement of sargassum in the, you know, the Gulf of Mexico and the North Atlantic often coincides with, um, at least along the East Coast, a little bit of the turtle hatching season as well. So there's something really interesting going on, and I think next steps really need to look more closely at sargassum, sargassum movement, and quote unquote behavior, turtle interactions with sargassum. And uh, you notice over here in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, we do catch turtles there, and we do catch 
uh, see a lot of sargassum in that red uh, big question mark area, but the critical habitat, at least for loggerheads, was not designated for that area. Uh, for Kemp's Ridleys and Greens, the critical habitat has not yet been established, so that may be of interest as well. And you know, right after the BP oil spill, and also thanks to the FIO um, F Centers of Excellence, FL, or I can the the yeah the Restore Act grants, uh, we benefited from this uh, and some post oil spill money. And so I've been going out for a number of years and initially working with FWC and then NOAA and National Marine Fisheries and Service and now uh, with my own research program when we're catching turtles in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we go offshore, we dip net them, and we target those sargassum areas. We're putting satellite tags on them and we're basically sciencing the heck out of them. We'll take anything that we can from them, tissue, blood. Uh, I have a graduate student here, she can tell you all about her work but she's doing movement models and looking at stock of origin for these animals and trying to back calculate where they may have originated from using both uh, genetics and uh, some uh, passive particle modeling. And also moving forward too, uh, a lot of these animals are doing some really cool things. Uh, I'll, I'll mention what in a second, but we're releasing oceanographic drifters that we know are passive drifters. And what we've found is that these little turtles are behaving very differently from a known passive drifter that's released at the same time and place as they are. And uh, this is a graph of a drifter that, uh, the two drifters in the blue that just kind of lurked and went uh, net movement to the east, whereas a little green turtle had very directed movement uh, to the, sorry, to the, the drifters went to the west and the turtles went to the east. I'm a little directionally dyslexic. Uh, and this is, kind of an overview of all the different tracks that we've had and what's really striking is that we're catching turtles as they're transitioning from the oceanic to the neuritic and to the coastal habitats but we're finding that there's some plasticity in this and the behavior of these guys is not a one-way um, movement to these coastal waters where then they remain they're going in they're coming back out sometimes they're going back in and some of them are leaving, hitting the Gulf Stream and the Straits, um, and the, well, first the loop current, and then uh, hitting the Gulf Stream and heading to the North Atlantic as well. So there's a lot of connectivity going on, which is really neat. And you know, this is really just work that we're doing in the North Atlantic. And Florida is an excellent place for this. We're able to access turtles at all stages of their lives. And we're able to get some of these oceanic turtles and do some really neat work. Uh, but the key thing is, is that as we start to tag and track turtles in different places, we're finding that you know, it's not really the gold standard. We can't assume that what we see here is going to be indicative of behavior and uh, what other rookeries are doing. And so there's still a lot of areas in rookeries that we don't know much about where the turtles can be found offshore. Uh, I am working in the South Atlantic and we're tagging little loggerheads down there. They're behaving completely differently. They're hanging close to shore. Some of them go south early in the hatching season. Some go north late in the hatching season. Some of them are crossing the equator going into the North Atlantic. So there is incredible connectivity in the North Atlantic and the South, between the North and South Atlantic. And that maybe that's why we see some hybrids up here in Florida as well. Now moving forward, probably uh, the biggest need for sea turtle uh, research is still to fill those early uh, life history data gaps. And the way to do that is that we need better technology. We need smaller tags. We need lightweight tags. We need tags that uh, can stay on the turtles longer. And one initiative that we're, my lab is involved with is the Icarus Initiative, where uh, just uh, last uh, two weekends ago, uh, the first of two launches uh, from the Russian Space Agency, and this is, they're carrying some Max Planck equipment up to the International State Space Station, but we're in the process of deploying a lower orbiting receiver to be put on the International Space Station. And the next launch is gonna be in February, and then I think we'll be able to start beta testing right at the end of the um, Florida, yeah, right at the end of our um, grant that I had proposed to do some, use some of these tags for. 
Uh, but they, uh, this as a lower orbiting receiver, uh, it, it won't require as much uh, juice with the tags, as much power to communicate with that overhead uh, receiver. So it'll allow for a number of much smaller animals to be tracked, not just sea turtles, but other species of birds, bats, all sorts of things. So a whole new world of taxa can be uh, examined and understood in terms of their movements and behavior and their long-term migrations. So thank you to funding for this, both NOAA and uh, the NSF Graduate Research Program and also the F Florida Restore Act Center for Excellence. Thanks. Um, so we're going to do, if anyone has a super, super brief question while we transition the projector um, and, uh, and bring Jess up, uh, feel free to ask away. Easy. Oh, yep. How do you find the sargassum? Is it just ad hoc or do you use? It's a couple different um, approaches. And one includes uh, Robert Hardy, who is based here at, um, uh, I guess, well, he's with FWC, but he, uh, we call him up and he has access to some. Uh, models that we don't have access to and he'll say hey there's a good frontal zone in this area you might want to target it. Uh, we go out of a couple different places one being Cortez another being Venice Louisiana and when we're out of Venice Louisiana we work with some fishermen there who also uh, work those lines and so they typically know if there's a really good um, frontal area and uh, sargassum line because that's where the good fish um, are as well. So I need to sign up for one of those fisheries uh, logins where you can go in and find out where the good frontal areas are for the good fishing and uh, but it I just haven't done that I usually just uh, hook up with fishermen or the folks who have access right, and just if you could get the mic on so we can get the, the yeah. recordings for you. 